right. Well, good morning, and thank you, Jed and uh, uh, Ed, for inviting me to be here. And uh, today I want to share with you a little bit about some of the, I would say, historical perspective on nicotine and pain, and then maybe um, talk more about our more recent work, ongoing work on uh, the impact of pain, especially chronic pain, on nicotine dependence in animal models. And um, I'm not going to take credit for the work uh, because I didn't do the work personally, but uh, it's the work of the talented graduate student in my lab, Yasmin, which is uh, here today. She's excited to be in her first Duke nicotine meeting. So she's here, and um, if you have any question on the, the, uh, you know, the studies, you can talk to her. Uh, so, um, I, I know Joe is going to do a much better job uh, on, on this, but I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview on this, that there is a definitely, over the years, a relationship between nicotine slash smoking and, and chronic, acute and chronic pain. Um, Jed touched base on that a little bit, but uh, chronic pain patients seem to smoke at a significantly higher rates than the general population. And um, maybe because smoking could also be used as a mean of self-medication for stressor and negative effect related to chronic pain. And uh, there is evidence, and I'll show you some of the evidence, that nicotine uh, in human and animal studies can induce a acute uh, analgesia or antinociception in animals, and that nicotine withdrawal abstinence can induces hyperalgesia. I'm gonna, you know, focus more on the animal side, but I'll mention some of the human studies. And and and, and Joe Dietre, Joe is, you know, we're fortunate to have him here. We'll talk more about uh, some of the work that suggests that pain can be a potent motivator for smoking. So what I did is, is come up with a certain model, and I borrowed this a little bit from a, a recent review from George Koob on alcohol pain. So the idea is there's this cycle, you know, self-feeding cycles between pain and, and, and nicotine, where, uh, let's see, do we have a, uh, I can use the, uh, do I have a pointer or, oh, thank you. So the idea that there is a, a r relationship between pain and smoking on one side, you know, nic uh, nicotine or smoking intake will induce a uh, analgesic effects which will relieve pain. However, you will see later, one of the problems with using nicotine uh, for uh, repeatedly for chronic pain is the development of tolerance to, uh, to this effect. Um, the other dark side of it, like uh, Ed was saying, is that, you know, nicotine abstinence, so smoke and abstinence, will induce hyperalgesia. That is shown in animal studies and human studies too, and, you know, which will induce a state of hyperalgesia and may worsen pain. So this whole business of cycle between the positive effect and negative effect is also compounded by some studies suggesting, and it's not clear, that smoking chronic, in, in chronic smokers, there is a worsening of chronic pain. Some studies in human came out. The animal data is not clear. Is it the smoking and or nicotine or, or simply nicotine that causing that is still not clear. So let's focus on this first positive thing you know, does nicotine have analgesic properties? And there's several studies in, in, in animals. I'm not gonna, you know, get over that. But qu clearly, in, in many studies in my lab and many other labs, nicotinic agonist and nicotine does have anti nociceptive effect in acute and chronic pain model. In many, many, you know, mouse and uh, rodent pain models. In the human, Pamela Flood and many others show that nicotine, you know, have analgesic properties in uh, post-operative pain, pre-operative pain. And I put here for your um, reading three meta-analyses, and the most recent one is by Joe, uh, that really touch upon this. The bottom line message that, you know, take-home message that 
Yes, nicotine have analgesic effects in acute and chronic pain model, but that effect is modest and depend on the sex. There's sex differences in that effect. And also, most importantly, the fact also it depends on the status of smoking. You know, it's, it, there is some evidence suggesting that that effect of nicotine is disappears in smokers or former smokers. You know, suggesting that the idea of tolerance and desensitization may play a role. So that's, you know, uh, one study, old study in our lab that shows that chronic nicotine in the animals shifted the nicotine dose response curve and the hot plates test to the right, to the right, suggest definitely showing definite, you know, uh, you know, development of chronic tolerance. And also, there's also development of acute tolerance to nicotine antinoceptive effect. So that's why, you know, um, Pamela Flood and, uh, and I argued a couple years ago that nicotine has analgesic is probably out. But the idea was to focus on nicotinic agonist has a, a way, uh, you know, has a use for, uh, you know, analgesia and, and pain modulation and relief. But again, you know, you make these, we make these conclusions and recommendation and new data comes out and makes you reconsider things, okay? So this paper came from our lab recently, showed that nicotine in the animal model reverses and prevent chemo-induced, you know, neuropathy, neuropathic pain in the animal model. So I was lucky because I convinced a, a neuro-oncologist in my cancer center at VCU and he is going to start a study, pilot study on nicotine patches for chronic pain, for chemo induced uh, peripheral chronic pain. So you never know. What are the mechanisms involved in, in terms uh, of these analgesic properties of nicotine? Okay, um, there is a tons of work on that. I'm going to summarize only, instead of going on the neurocircuitry, which Jed did a great job on that, I want to focus on the primary target of nicotine, which is nicotinic receptors. This is a, an old but really uh, a, a great work done, uh, we, we've done with, at the lab of Jean-Pierre Changeur, where we clearly showed that the anti effect of nicotine is alpha-4 beta-2 dependent in the, these, these knockout mice the effect of nicotine, the antineceptive of nicotine, is completely gone, uh, even if you went to very high doses in these animals. And later on, with Jeff Morgels and others, we showed that that effect is not only alpha-4, beta-2, but probably involved other subunits that co-assemble with alpha-4, beta-2, is alpha-5 and alpha-6. Which brings also to us this, I, this, this issue is nicotinic agonist analgesics you know, that targets alpha-4 beta-2, targets the same subtypes that is involved in the reinforcing and dependence effects of nicotine. So that's, you know, thought, uh, it's just a thought for that. On the other dark side, part of it is, you know, does nicotine, you know, abstinence, uh, you know, uh, provokes or induce, uh, you know, an increase of pain state, hyperalgesic state? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, there's many studies uh, from our lab. This is, for example, uh, a study that shows that in mice giving nicotine chronically and then, you know, nicotine removed, you can see a time-dependent, in, you know, in, uh, in induction of hyperalgesic response here using the hot plates test. Uh, and then that effect is completely gone in the alpha-7 knockout, suggesting that alpha-7 nicotinic subtypes do play a major role into this, you know, hyperalgesia induced by nicotine withdrawal. And then there's great work, um, you know, more elegant work done by uh, uh, Olivier, and hopefully he'll talk about this a little bit more, where he shows that m uh, rats self administering nicotine, when nicotine is taken off, do show a consistent hyperalgesia. Here he used, uh, you know, mechanical hypersensitivity, and that effect is, all, is seems to mediate a TRF receptor uh, mechanisms in the brain. And then uh, Nick Gilpin also uh, uh, showed that in, in the rats. And uh, so it is clear that uh, nicotinic receptors, uh, 
that the nicotine withdrawal induces a state of hyperalgesia, which brings this relationship between nicotine dependence, pain, has a risk factor for uh, smoking, relapse, uh, and, and motivation uh, for, for smoking. But what today I want to talk about is uh, this aspect that is not well studied. What is the relationship between pain and nicotine dependence? And more specifically, does chronic neuropathic pain impact nicotine dependence? So for that, we used um, three you know, models of uh, chronic uh, pain. One is the chemo-induced uh, peripheral neuropathy. You, as you know, this is a major side, a limiting side effect for chemo drugs, Ma several chemo uh, anti-cancer drugs, taxanes, platinum drugs, many other drugs. Also the nerve injury, you can think about it, have, nerve to have trauma induced, peripheral neuropathy, and HIV, the more recent work we, we started, HIV induced peripheral neuropathy. Again, a well-known side effect of HIV infection. So uh, I'm gonna start with the uh, chemo induced peripheral neuropathy. We focus on, on uh, 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 Taxol or Paclitaxel. As I told you, this is a major side effect. And for that, we um, took some time and, and you know, uh, developed a model in the mouse. So um, this model is a, in, in male and female mice. Uh, in this case, 57 black 6J mice. So we gave them uh, a regimen of eight milligram per keg of paclitaxel, four injections every other day with a cumulative dose of 32 milligram per keg, okay? The equivalent of, uh, you know, almost 113 milligram per square meter uh, in human, that is a moderate uh, regimen of, of taxol. Um, so what, what paclitaxel does here induces a thermal and, and cold allodynia, those dependent. You can see here the sensitivity, the animals become hypersensitive to uh, the von Frey, which is a filament. You touch the mouse and the mouse will withdraw their, their, uh, uh, their paw. And the sensitivity to cold, the, their sensitivity to cold become hyper exaggerated. There are also reduction in the nerve, intraepidermal nerve fibers after paclitaxel. These are, this is a well-known features in, in neurop chemo-induced neuropathy in a human. The dorsal root ganglia is hyperporalized also, and there's a reduction of the nerve conductance, the caudal nerve conductance in these animals. The amplitude here showing clearly there is a reduction of the number of nerves that conduct the signal. All these are well-known feature of uh, you know, neuropathy uh, in, in the human and in the animal. So we took these animals that are in a, a state of chronic uh, neuropathic pain, and then we gave them, after we gave them paclitaxel, we gave them nicotine chronically for 14 days through those mini pumps that deliver nicotine constantly. One of the main reason we do that is that the half-life of nicotine in the mouse is like 10 minutes, you, uh, you know. And um, to do self-administration IV in the mouse, it's a nightmare, okay? So maybe two, three labs, you know, Paul Kenny and others, but we weren't successful in that. So we decided to induce dependence by giving nicotine chronically in mini pumps for 14 days, and then we remove the mini pumps and we measure nicotine withdrawal. So we did one cohort early time, we call it early time, almost 10 days after the first injection of paclitaxel, and then 70 days, 60 days here, to 70 days after paclitaxel, the separate cohort of mice. Because you know, I, I, I want you to think about this chronicity of pain, it is not a, uh, it's not a fro frozen in time. It's a, a, you know, a dynamic, you know, uh, a phenomena that gets worse sometimes with time. In fact, 25 to 30 percent of, of, can of cancer survivors that taking chemotherapy continue to show years after the therapy, chemotherapy, you know, peripheral neuropathy and pain. So we measured a couple of uh, signs. 
anxiety-like behaviors in using like dark boxes, and rodents hates what is open, lightened, and, and you know, spaces. Um, we measure the somatic signs. This is a signs in the animal of irritation. They start, you know, having spot tremors, shaking. They walk backward. Normally, they never do these things, but under withdrawal, uh, instead of withdrawal, they do. We measure hyperalgesia using the hot place test, and also their anhedonia-like behavior, you know, by, you know, using the sucrose test. Simply, it's a two-bottle choice. The animal will choose between sucrose and water. Rodents, like humans, they love sucrose, they love chocolate, they love all these things, okay? So here's the data. Um, you, to our surprise, the animals, remember this is the early time point, the animals are in a state of chronic neuropathic pain. Well, we found that the animals that uh, got nicotine, uh, you know, and under paclitaxel, 10 days after paclitaxel show a more significantly higher level of withdrawal in the somatic signs. To our shock, no change in hyperalgesia, same level, but even more anxiety-like behavior and no change in anodynia-like behavior. There's a decrease, obviously, as you can see in the control of sucrose preference, but it's not changed under paclitaxel. What is even more interesting is that when you go to a late type point, remember that like this is 70 days after the, uh, you know, the, the paclitaxel uh, regimen. There's even more intense increase in somatic signs, still no change in hyperalgesia, more anxiety-like behavior, and now we see even an increase in anhedonia-like behavior. So you may say, oh, okay, that's nice, but maybe the paclitaxel impacted the nicotine metabolism, right? Very true. So we took these animals and we measured the blood level of nicotine and cotinine, and we didn't, after, under paclitaxel or vehicle, we didn't find any significant level. This does not mean that there is no change in the kinetics and the elimination. It's a one-time shot time, you know, uh, uh, after 24, uh, 14 days, and there's no difference. How about reward? So we measured the aspect of, of withdrawal. Uh, so we obviously, as I told you, not an easy task to do nicotine reinforcement in self-administration in mice. So we chose to do condition place preference. This is a Pavlovian, you know, uh, paradigm. We use an unbiased design where the animals are conditioned you know, to one of those, one of two uh, compartments that had different textures, different color, you know, and then, you know, for four days, uh, uh, I mean, three days conditioning, pre-testing, three days conditioning, and the test day, they receive nicotine, and they're conditioned in these boxes. And then on the test day, they're, they're not giving any drug, and they were, uh, you know, giving the choice to choose the, the two compartment, one was that condition was vehicle and one was nicotine. Here's what we, we did also. We did the same things, an early time point and a late time point after paclitaxel. And um, we didn't see any change in a, a fairly robust dose of nicotine that induces preference in the vehicle animal, but there was no change in uh, nicotine uh, preference in the early time point. However, in the late time point, meaning 70 days after PAC, there is a reduction of nicotine preference. And we did later on, now it's here, a full dose response curves, and the effects of nicotine cannot be overcome by higher doses of nicotine. So we say, well, wait a minute, maybe these animals, Paclitaxel messed up their whole conditioning reward processes. So we did palatable food. They love sucrose completely, so we train them to, we condition them uh, with the CPP, with sucrose pellets, and then we didn't find any difference at this same time frame with uh, food-induced place preference, suggesting that it's not a non-behavior, non-specific behavioral effect. We also did a, 
a full uh, you know, time course with nicotine, uh, prefer nicotine uh, plasma levels and cotinine uh, acutely uh, between PAC and, and the paclitaxel and vehicle, and we found no difference in the time course of nicotine and cotinine uh, under paclitaxel. Interestingly enough, last year, this paper came from Larry, Larry Tall and his collaborator, where they used rats for self-administration, uh, self doing nicotine self-administration, and um, they did nerve injury, uh, where they injured the uh, peripheral nerves and induced a state of uh, neuropathic pain, and they did nicotine self-administration in multiple time, and they were expecting, like we all expecting, they were expecting that there will be an increase of intake, right? If there is a pain of state, animals will take more pain. But what happened is that they saw almost the opposite, that they didn't find a, an increase in nicotine intake. They probably saw a tendency toward a uh, decrease of nicotine intake. And when they did uh, uh, you know, prime induce uh, reinstatement, they saw that animal and pain reduced their, uh, their reinstatement. Very surprising. But it goes along with our reward here where nicotine reward is completely reduced in animals under chronic pain. So we, 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 we're starting into the mechanisms. Okay, this is a very, uh, you know, tough, uh, you know, uh, investigations because there's really many possibilities and I'll speak about this a little bit. As I told you, there is no difference in nicotine uh, and cotinine plasma level of their paclitaxel. But one of the things we did in, in the nerve injury model, and not PAC, the nerve injury, is that we you know, investigated, does the sensitivity, pharmacological sensitivity to nicotine changes? And then here's the effect of nicotine, anti nociceptive effect of nicotine in the tail flick test. This is in the sham animal. You see a, f a nice dose response curve, fully efficacious, but in animals with nerve injury, chronic pain, there is a shift to the right, a decrease in nicotine sensitivity. That suggests that there may be changes in nicotine function or receptor distribution or expression in areas involved in nociception and pain. We also did now, uh, you know, uh, we also did another model because you say, well, okay, maybe paclitaxel is something that is um, particular. You know, uh, we know that most in, in, in cancer patients, uh, you know, uh, treated with chemotherapy, m over three-fourths or two-thirds of the patient who are smokers, when they are told you have a, a cancer related to your smoking, they stop smoking. But within a year or two, most of them, two-thirds who abstain from smoking, they relapse again. So you may say, well, maybe that's specific for smoking. So we did another chronic pain model, which is the HIV peripheral neuropathy, which is a main, main issue, um, uh, main side effect with people, people living with HIV AIDS. They have a um, uh, you know, high prevalence of uh, you know, chronic pain, but they also have, have high prevalence of smoking and nicotine dependence. So, um, we used a model developed by uh, our colleague. As you know, there is uh, several viral proteins that are involved in HIV. One of them is the TAT viral protein, which, you know, interesting because um, it's expressed in CNS and in the periphery, and it's not attenuated by, uh, you know, uh, patients receiving retroviral treatment, and it stays for years in patients with HIV. So my colleague, uh, Kurt Hauser, developed this TAT mouse that overexpressed the TAT on demand. All what you have to do is uh, put doxycycline in their, in their drink, water, food, and the mouse will express TAT everywhere, including the brain. So a couple of years ago, with uh, you know, uh, my lab and with Kurt, uh, and we uh, tested these mice for neuropathy, and we found indeed there is a neuropathy that develops when the animals have this uh, overexpress of TAT, 
and then it's time dependent. This is the sensitivity to uh, mechanical hypersensitivity. The animals have a, a reductions of uh, intraepidermal nerve fibers uh, here, and then they have a, an uh, activation of microglia uh, uh, when their TAT is expressed. So um, a, a valid model for uh, uh, HIV-induced neuropathy. So what happened to nicotine dependence in these animals? Do we see the same thing? So we implanted these animals after uh, you know, the uh, TAT over expression. With mini pump, we did the same thing. And here we were surprised. The intensity of nicotine withdrawal almost doubled in somatic signs. And the anxiety-like behavior, there is a even exaggeration. And there is also a even further hyperalgesia that is shown in these animals. So um, I, I talked about that, so I'm going to summarize you know, quickly. So uh, in two chronic neuropathic pain model, we do show that nicotine withdrawal intensity is increased. And in one of them, there is a reduction of nicotine reward properties. And um, we need more to do. We need to investigate the reinforcing effect of nicotine restatement and start exploring uh, possible mechanism. One question that a lot of these studies, including ours, fail to address, that these animals were naive. They've never had a history of nicotine. What happened if these animals have a history of nicotine, which is what happens in, in real life, right? So that's something we're interested in. Uh, mechanisms, as I say, changes in neuronal nicotinic receptors. This is from the same study by Terry Lo uh, Larry Toll that shows that in many brain regions involved in, in, in pain modulation, there's a reduction of many of these nicotinic receptors expression. So that's a, that's a possibility. The other one is, maybe Jed Rhodes will be convinced to do some of these studies, is chronic pain induces a, a state of hypodopaminergic you know, uh, tone. Same thing, hypodopaminergia uh, was you know, reported with uh, many studies in rodents after chronic nicotine withdrawal. So it is very possible that changes in mesolabbing dopamine system may mediate that worsening of nicotine withdrawal what we see. Anyway, stay tuned. I'm hoping that Yasmin would, that's her project for her thesis, and then we'll continue on this mechanism. I want to thank a great team in my lab. You know, they really make this possible, my collaborators, NCI uh, and NIDA for their funding and, and their support from our Messy Cancer Center. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ahmad. And uh, we do have time for some questions. Jed Rose. Go easy on me, Jed. <laughs> no, great, great talk. Very, very interesting. And I just had a thought, a question about the, um, in the, you know, neuropathic pain model, the, the reduced nicotine reward mm. could be, you know, some of the explanations you, you mentioned, and I just wonder, could it also be that nicotine is acting peripherally to induce pain? Because, I mean, nicotine mm -hmm. does stimulate pain nerve endings. Could they be more sensitive to those aversive actions of nicotine, and that shows up as reduced reward, eventually? That's, that's, a, that's a good point. We can, we can definitely do that. We can do condition place aversion. Definitely, yeah. Olivier. Hi, that was a great talk, Imad. Thanks. Um, could you comment a little bit on the, the different subunit between alpha-5, alpha-7, alpha-4, beta-2? Do you have a, what's your opinion on which one would be most involved in the uh, antinociception effects of nicotine? Uh, you mean the pain effects of nicotine? Yeah. Look, I mean, uh, so um, Abbott invested a lot of time uh, into developing nicotinic agonists as pain analgesics, and they kind of failed you know, for many reasons, and I'm not here to criticize Abbott. But they uh, tested the ABT594, which is the first analgesic nicotinic base, and it, in diabetic neuropathy, chronic neuropathy. And it, was, it, it showed really dose-dependent uh, you know, decrease in pain score. But the problem was the safety, okay? a lot of nausea and adverse side effect. And then when they developed this ABT894, a more selective one, much more safer, it lacked analgesic property in the same model. 
this is where we said, wait a minute, you're not targeting the right alpha-4 beta-2 subtype because there is an alpha-6, a beta-3, and alpha-5. And that's why with Jeff Mogul and uh, others, we did this alpha-5 and alpha-6 showing they are involved in the nicotine analgesic properties in animal models at least. So I, I do think that there is still you know, um, a chance that we develop nicotinic agonists for pain, but we have to target the right uh, you know, subtypes, probably involving alpha-5 and alpha-6. Good. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Thank well, you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks.